It is easy to see the events of Scripture, including those connected with the life of Christ, as merely a series of temporally successive events. The only theological connection between them is the fact that one event, historically, leads to another, and thus the later events would have been impossible without the previous ones. How would Jesus be able to rise from the dead, for example, if he never died to begin with? If God is incorporeal, and therefore not subject to death, at least not on a physical level, how could he die unless he became man? Nonetheless, the connection between the various events in the life of Christ are not just chronological, but also spiritual. Everything Christ did related to God's larger plan of salvation, and therefore, Christ never acted haphazardly. Everything he did, he did for a reason. Yet, when attempting to explain the theological significance of a particular event in the life of Christ, it is easy to look at each event in isolation and speak about its significance in a vacuum. Yet, the more you analyze a teaching, action, or event from the life of Christ, the more one begins to realize the close connection, even interdependence, of one teaching, action, or event with every other teaching, action, or event in the life of Christ. In my opinion, the Bible and the Church Fathers pour a lot of effort into and spill a lot of ink on attempting to explain the meaning and necessity of the resurrection and its relationship to the cross. Yet, as time progressed, at least in the Western Church, the majority of the theological emphasis shifted to speaking of the cross, particularly questions such as why did Jesus need to suffer on the cross in order to save us from sin, and do the effects or the merits of Christ's death apply to all people or only to the elect? The resurrection, while still seen as being a big deal, in popular theological discourse ended up taking a backseat to the crucifixion. It does seem, though, that there are at least subtle recognitions of the close systematic interconnection of the cross and the resurrection. For example, in the Easter prayer, the Exaltet, it speaks frequently of the crucifixion, but at times speaks of the crucifixion in such a way that it and the resurrection are seamlessly intertwined. For example, the text reads, quote, these then are the feasts of Passover, in which is slain the Lamb, the one true Lamb, whose blood anoints the doorposts of believers." Unquote. So Easter is symbolically connected to the Passover, in which a Lamb was sacrificed for the salvation of the Israelites. Yet the text goes on to say, and I quote, This is the night, when Christ broke the prison bars of death, and rose victoriously from the underworld." Unquote. So this night is also identified as the night in which Jesus rose from the dead, thereby freeing us from the bondage to death. In a sense, these aren't two sets of symbols that are applied to the same feast day, but in a manner completely unconnected from one another. Rather, these two sets of symbols are closely connected. Why was the Lamb sacrificed? In order to save the Israelites from the angel of death. Yet Christ is also described as breaking the quote-unquote prison bars of death. Christ, in rising from the dead, ended death's dominion over the human race. Thus, when the Exaltet goes on to say, quote, This is the night when once you led our forebears, Israel's children, from slavery in Egypt, and made them pass dry shod over the Red Sea, unquote, the passing from Egypt to the Holy Land could be a reference to either our liberation from sin or our liberation from death. This subtly points towards a larger theological truth, namely that we cannot entirely separate the theological discourse that comes from contemplating the resurrection 
and that which comes forth from contemplating the death of Christ. And I think this is clear from the works of the Church Fathers. Without making overly broad claims about the Church Fathers, and therefore at the risk of sounding overly simplistic in my analysis, one major theme in the Church Fathers is the notion that Jesus' incarnation, death, and resurrection are all tied together by a common thread, namely the attempt to renew or restore human nature, corrupted as it was by the effects of sin. We see this, for example, in the works of Saint Athanasius. Athanasius writes that God is the source of all being and existence, but sin is a turning away from God. Sin, therefore, is a turning away from the source of all being and existence. To turn away from God is to turn towards nothingness. Death is therefore an expression of the ontological corruption that comes about from sin, or as a result of sin. Yet, God being infinitely merciful did not abandon his creation. He decided to redeem us from our sin, to save us from the effects of sin and death. He did so by becoming human, by dying on the cross and from rising from the dead. This way of saving us from sin can be compared to a king who attempts to squash a rebellion in his kingdom by directly invading the place where the rebellion originated. By making himself present in the place where his kingly presence is resisted, the king, ironically, re-establishes order in his kingdom. The same is true with God. Athanasius goes on to write, and I quote, Thus, then, God has made man, and wills that he should abide in incorruption. But men, having despised and rejected the contemplation of God, and devising and contriving evil for themselves, as was said in the former treatise, received the condemnation of death with which they had been threatened, and from thenceforth no longer remained as they were made, but were being corrupted according to their devices. And death had the mastery over them as king, as Romans chapter 5 verse 14 says. For a transgression of the commandment was turning them back to their natural state, so that just as they had had their being from out of nothing, so also, as might be expected, they might look for corruption into nothing in the course of time. For if, out of a former normal state of non-existence, they were called into being by the presence and the loving kindness of the Word, it followed naturally that when men were bereft of the knowledge of God and were turned back to what was not, for what is evil is not, but what is good is, they should, since they derive their being from God who is, be everlastingly bereft even of being. In other words, that they should be disintegrated and abide in death and corruption." Unquote. Athanasius goes on to explain that the divine nature is immortal, and by uniting that which was immortal to that which was mortal, that is, human nature, human nature was purified and elevated out of its current state. That which was mortal was rendered immortal through its union with the divine. Athanasius can therefore write, and I quote, We have then now stated in part as far as it was possible, and as ourselves had been able to understand, the reason of his bodily appearing, that it was in the power of none other to turn the corruptible to incorruption except the Savior himself, that had at the beginning also made all things out of nothing, and that none other could create anew the likeness of God's image for men, save the image of the Father, and that none other could render the mortal immortal, save our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the very life itself, and that none other could teach men of the Father, and destroy the worship of idols, save the Lord, that orders all things, and is alone the true only begotten of the Father." Unquote. Dying on the cross, 
was part of the process of renewing or recreating fallen human nature. Jesus suffered on behalf of the entire human race, and in doing so, in a sense, absorbed death into himself and defeated it. Again, Athanasius goes on to say, and I quote, Whence, as I said before, the Word, since it was not possible for him to die, as he was immortal, took to himself a body such as could not die, that he might offer it as his own in the steed of all, and a suffering through his union with it on behalf of all, bring to naught him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage." Unquote. In death he defeated death. The purpose of the resurrection is to witness to this fact. Building on a theme first put forward in the Gospel according to St. John chapter 12, verse 24, St. Athanasius writes, quote, Why, now that the common Savior of all has died on our behalf, we, the faithful in Christ, no longer die the death as before, agreeably to the warning of the law. For this condemnation has ceased, but corruption ceasing and being put away by the grace of the resurrection, henceforth we are only dissolved, agreeably to our body's mortal nature, at the time God has fixed for each, that we may be able to gain a better resurrection. For like the seeds which are cast into the earth, we do not perish by dissolution, but are sown into the earth, and shall rise again, death having been brought to naught by the grace of the Savior. Hence it is that the blessed Paul, who was made a surety of the resurrection to all, says, This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Unquote. He then goes on to say, quote, The death on the cross, then, for us has proved seemly and fitting and its cause has been shown to be reasonable in every respect. And it may justly be argued that in no other way than by the cross was it right for the salvation of all to take place. For not even thus, not even the cross, did he leave himself concealed. But far otherwise, while he made creation witness to the presence of its maker, he suffered not the temple of his body to remain long, but having merely shown that it was dead by the contact of death with it, he straightway raised it upon the third day, bearing away as the mark of victory and the triumph over death the incorruptibility and impassibility which resulted to his body." Unquote. Essentially, through experiencing death, the immortal God, Athanasius states, defeated death, and by rising from the dead, he gave witness to his resurrection over death. He revealed in the empty tomb the reality that was concealed on the cross. What we see in Athanasius, we see, for slightly different reasons, in a more contemporary theologian, the German theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg. Pannenberg, like most Christians, believed that Jesus was both God and man. After the Incarnation, there was always an element of Jesus' existence, his divine nature, which transcended time and space, and therefore history, and another element of it, human nature, that existed within, and was therefore to some degree bound by history. Pannenberg believed that the Apostles, in their preaching, began with the contemplation of the earthly element of Christ, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection, and later abstracted from this certain larger spiritual truths. Nonetheless, Pannenberg also believed that, due to various historical and ideological reasons, 
popular theological discourse in the church began to strongly emphasize the part of Christ's identity as a pre-existent divine entity in such a way so as to de-emphasize his human identity. The rise of Scriptura Sola and later in the 19th and 20th centuries, the rise of the critical method of biblical interpretation helped us to return to a method of doing Christology that put equal emphasis on Jesus' humanity and his divinity. Annenberg thus suggested that we begin with the historical realities surrounding Christ and affirm the larger spiritual claims about Jesus based on, or to the extent that they can be justified by, the historical realities of Jesus. We as Christians believe what we believe because we believe that the historical creeds and confessions of Christianity can be vindicated by the historical reality of Jesus, but in particular the resurrection. The resurrection explicates that which was implicit in the pre-Easter elements of Jesus, namely Jesus' role as Lord and Savior, and as the Son of God made man. The resurrection is thus the lens through which the early church viewed everything, everything Jesus said and everything Jesus did, including everything he said and did before the resurrection. This doesn't reduce the importance of all that Jesus said and did before the resurrection, for everything Jesus did, from the moment of his conception to the moment of his ascension, reveals the true message and identity of Jesus. Yet, it is in the resurrection that the full glory of Jesus as the Son of God and as the Lord of all is made known. Everything that Jesus said about himself is affirmed in the resurrection. Pannenberg thus believed that if the resurrection did not occur, if it was not an historical event, then there were only two possible options. The first is go down the path of theologians such as Rudolf Bultmann, who said that most of what was said about Jesus was purely symbolic or mythical, and therefore has spiritual value but has little or no historical value, or two, we have to believe that there is a historical basis for the Christian faith, but the resurrection is not an historical event, and therefore we have to completely reframe the gospel message. What we see in both the Church Fathers and in Pannenberg is the notion not only that the cross and the resurrection should be looked at from the perspective of what makes them systematically distinct, that is, as distinct doctrines or distinct aspects of Christ's mission, but rather should be looked at as being systematically connected. There are a series of theological threads that connect the death and the resurrection of Christ, and may I suggest going forward that we as Catholics and the wider Christian community continue to emphasize this reality. And as we sort of end off the Easter season, may we, as we contemplate the resurrection of Christ, learn to not look at any part of Christ's mission, particularly the events of the Easter Triduum, in isolation, but rather see them as a web or a patchwork, each section of Christ's life and mission connecting to every other and deriving its meaning not just from itself in isolation, but from its connection to every other part of what Christ said and did.